Dear Heavenly Father, once again, dear Lord, we come to your throne of grace and mercy at this time, dear Lord. Thank you, dear Lord, for all the wonderful blessings you have bestowed upon us, dear Lord. Dear Lord, so thank you, dear Lord, you allow us to wake up to another beautiful day, another beautiful evening that we may come out and uh, learn another portion of your divine word, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we pray for those who are sick, inflicted, dear Lord, especially those of the household of faith, dear Lord. We're so thankful, for dear Lord, that those, us that's healthy, uh, uh, us that's healthy right now, Lord, we thank, they, thank you for putting us in that frame mind of our healthness with our mental, mental health and our physical health, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we pray for those in, um, who are traveling, dear Lord. We pray for those in the military, dear Lord. Be with them. Be with their families, dear Lord, while they're away from them. And dear Lord, just continue to be with us, dear Lord, as we get ready to go through this, this study, dear Lord, that we, the things that we have said and heard, dear Lord, that we may edify us, that we go, may go out and teach others another. Thus says the Lord. Dear Lord, we ask this prayer in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. We want to jump right in. We're going to do a little exploring tonight. We're going to go uh, into the Old Testament where we've been looking because we're going through this study uh, titled Doctrines of Men. And while it's not uh, centered towards any uh, Israelite group or anyone of that nature, uh, we do want to uh, take some time to examine uh, all of the scripture, including the Old Testament. I think one of the drawbacks in many Christian circles is that I don't think we really spend as much time there, uh, and that sometimes leads to us not being able to really have, you know, productive conversations. So we're going to be back in the Old Testament a little bit um, on this evening. Part one dealt with the introduction. Part two dealt with the origins, and we even went back to Africa a little bit in part two. Part three, we started to look at the law. Uh, part four, and again, uh, today on part five, we're going to, again, take a little bit uh, of a deeper look at the law. Last week, we looked at the 39 melicote, the 39 categories uh, or forms of work which were prohibited on the Sabbath. And we looked at that mainly for us being Christians as educational, uh, so that once again, when we can have, or when we need to have conversations with people, we can take a look at this and at least be aware and have uh, some uh, fruitful discussions and explaining to them why uh, the uh, law was nailed to the cross or at least that law that you do for uh, you know, making yourself uh, sanctified before God. Obviously, it does not mean that we go out and start killing people and you know, lying against our neighbor and all the things that were contained in the law, but at least for the purposes of salvation, we know that that comes through Christ Jesus and his, what he did on the cross and his blood atonement. So tonight, uh, again, a little bit more informative or, you know, kind of educational, a little broad view. I want to take a look at the Torah or the Pentateuch. Uh, the first five books in uh, our Bible, in our canon, is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And if we wanted to take a look at those individually, we would see that Genesis has 50 chapters. Um, it deals with creation and primeval history up to chapter number 11. And then starting in chapter number 12 through 50, you get into the lives of Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph. And in there, you would also get into the 12 tribes. Then Exodus, which is the next book, deals with the oppression because once uh, the Israel or the Jews had began to populate that land, the Egyptians uh, started to uh, enslave them, as we know, and they became enslaved in Egypt for quite a number of years. And God finally heard their cry and delivered them. So you find that in the book of Exodus beginning uh, at chapter 1 and goes into approximately chapter 14 and 15. And then once they are uh, liberated or freed from bondage, uh, they make way. They don't know where they're going, but God takes them to Mount Sinai. Uh, and this journey includes some of the murmur murmurings, uh, that is Exodus 14 through 19. And then when you get to Exodus chapter 20, uh, you're at Sinai. 
that's where you're dealing with the, you, they receive uh, the law. They receive the commandments. Uh, you find that in um, chapter number 20, verse 1 through 21. <clears throat> and in the book of the covenant, you'll find that in chapter number 20 uh, through chapter 23. And then Moses received the plans for the tabernacle. You'll find that in chapters 24 through 31. And then there was an incident in there in chapter 32 through 34 uh, that dealt with the golden calf, and then they had to renew uh, the covenant. And then chapter 35 through 40 dealt with the building of the tabernacle. So in Exodus, they have not left uh, Mount Sinai yet. That comes uh, a little bit later. We'll take a look at that. But the next book is the book of Leviticus, which is where we want to spend a little time tonight. The book of Leviticus deals with the holiness of God, the holiness of God and the holiness of the people. But if you looked at the book, uh, just, you know, a very, very broad outline, uh, you would find the laws of the priesthood. It goes uh, and deals with the sacrifices, chapter 1 through 6, verse number 7. And then starting at chapter 6, verse 8 through 736, it deals with the rights and duties of the priests. And then 8 through 10 is the consecration of the priest. And then 11 to 20 deals with various types of cleanness and uncleanness. 21 to 22, special laws of cleanness for the priest. And then 23 to 20, 27 deals with other laws of cleanness. And I, I, for me, I find this very interesting to see it laid out this way because it highlights for me the emphasis that God was placing on worshiping him. And we'll come back to that, but that is a lot about a lot of what the book of Leviticus is about is worshiping God. And so when you can see it in its overall context, sometimes that sharpens your view of what God was trying to say before we get into specific passages. Uh, so that's the book of Leviticus. The book of Numbers, uh, we know this, this uh, the book of Numbers, uh, chapters 1 through 9, there was a census and dedication of the tabernacle. And then the departure, the departure from Sinai. And then you find uh, in chapters 10 through 21, a chapter that we've done uh, um, a number of examinations of, but you find some very interesting things that happen uh, there in chapter 10 uh, through 21. You find the wilderness wanderings, the murmurings, the failure at Kadesh, we know about that, Korah's rebellion, then you have the budding of Aaron's rod or staff, and then the ashes of a red heifer, and the failure at Meribah. Sometimes you'll see it uh, noted as the waters of Meribah, and this is where uh, Moses uh, uh, struck the rock instead of spoke to the rock. Then you'll see Edom refuses passage of Israel. You'll find the death of Aaron, and then there was that very peculiar incident uh, with the brass serpent. And then when you get into chapter 21 through chapter 36, there was various, various conquests. We get there when we know the, um, the story of uh, Balak and Balaam and, and the talking donkey, uh, the idolatry at Shittim. I wish we had time to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, perhaps we will talk about that one day when we get back over to the book of Joshua because this is highly referenced uh, there in uh, Joshua. It's also referenced in the book of Micah, Micah chapter number 6. Uh, we always know that as Micah 6 and 8. Uh, what dost thou require of thee, O man? And so we know it from there. But if you go back a few verses, God talks about what happened in Shittim. And then you have the second census, and then the preparations for them to enter the land of Canaan. That is a summary of the 36 chapters of the book of Numbers. And then Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, uh, the word itself, uh, can mean second law. And for that, some people have uh, believed that it is a recitation of the law or a new law, and it's neither. It's where Moses is now looking at the law with 40 years of experience, because at this time, the old generation has died off. Uh, they are at the edge of the uh, River Jordan, about to cross over, 
and Moses gives uh, three speeches or sermons. Uh, the first one is a historical prologue, and in there he talks about God's grace in the past by bringing them out of bondage. He talks about God's grace in the present by getting them to the point that they're ready to cross over into the promised land. And then he talks about God's grace in the future, how God will take care of them once they cross over. So a very powerful first lesson there from Moses. And then the second and the third speech uh, can be broken down into two parts each. Not every, uh, not every outline will have them this way. I think this is a, a good way because it just helps us refine it a little bit more. But you don't always see it broken down this way. But the second speech, part A, is uh, general covenant and stipulations. The second speech, speech part B, is more specific uh, stipulations. The third speech, part A, is blessings and cursings. And we'll probably come back around to that, uh, particularly because there are people in, uh, in various doctrines that believe uh, blacks and Hispanics and various people, uh, uh, the curses that are noted, particularly in Deuteronomy 28, are, 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 were realized in, for example, uh, the transatlantic slave trade. So we'll look at that a little bit closer, again, not to uh, delve too deep, but when we get to that, we want to have a conversation and be able to look uh, from the time of Moses' third speech in the book of Deuteronomy, were, were any of those uh, curses uh, enacted in Israel over the hundreds of years before you even had a transatlantic slave trade? So uh, again, this is why it's good to know the context so we can see uh, where those blessings and cur cursings uh, fall in the overall narrative of the Torah. The third speech, part B, was the final exhortation. And then uh, the lat latter part there is the succession of leadership. If you look at that last part, some people, uh, and it's probably true, believe that Moses did not write the last part of the book of Deuteronomy uh, because he, in theory, he was dead. So it is believed that uh, Joshua carried this and, they, and they, they had a lot of oral traditions and it was carried down uh, perhaps even to the time of Ezra the scribe where he basically took that oral tradition and wrote it down, and that concluded uh, the, book of, uh, the book of Deuteronomy. Now, as mentioned before, I wanted to go back a little bit uh, into the book of Levit Leviticus. Leviticus in the Torah is a very special uh, book because it deals with God's holiness and it deals with how to worship God. And so just some general... Uh, um, you know, information about Leviticus receives its name from the Septuagint, the pre-Christian Greek translation of the Old Testament. It means relating to the Levites. Its Hebrew title, and I don't want to try to pronounce that, uh, is the first word in the Hebrew text of the book and means, and he called, and he being the Lord called. Although Leviticus does not deal only with the special duties of the Levites, it is so named because it concerns mainly the service of worship at the tabernacle. Again, it is a very important book when we understand its context in terms of what God was telling his people. Go on and read that. It says, which was conducted by the priests who were the sons of Aaron, assisted by many from the rest of the tribe of Levi, Exodus, gave the direction for building a tabernacle, and now Leviticus gives the laws and regulations for worshiping there. Where? At the tabernacle, including instructions on ceremonial cleanliness, moral laws, holy days, Sabbath year, and the year of Jubilee. These laws were given, at least for the most part, during the year that Israel camped at Mount Sinai, where God directed Moses in organizing Israel worship, government, and military forces. And while I'm here, uh, we just want to uh, note and recognize that the Apostle Paul, when he was instructing Titus and Timothy, uh, and even uh, when he was at Ephesus and he helped establish elders, Paul didn't just make that up. He didn't just dream that up. He was basing everything off of what he knew and studied in the law. So if you really want to see uh, what you might call the first elders and, again, the first deacons, you would have to go into the law where Paul was. And that's where you will find uh, not the specific duties, but some of the descriptive uh, 
the, some of the descriptive things in terms of your overall responsibility, in terms of handling the place of God's worship and, and how that is to remain uh, sacred. That was some general outline. Theologically, theologically, the book of Leviticus, it's a manual of re- regulations enabling the holy king to set up his earthly throne among the people of his kingdom. It explains how they are to be his holy people and to worship him in a holy manner. Remember Romans 15, 4. Things of old time were written for our what? Learning. Okay, holiness in this sense means to be separated from sin and set apart exclusively to the Lord for his purpose and for his glory. So the key thought of the book is holiness, as we mentioned before. God's holiness and the holiness of the people. There's some notes that you can find on those passages. The holiness of God and his people, uh, they must revere him in holiness. In Leviticus, uh, spiritual holiness is symbolized by physical uh, perfection. Make a note of that because over the years, what Israel began to do was they they didn't follow the, uh, they didn't follow and or understand Uh, the essence of the law, they were going for the word of the law. So if you were blind or you had poor eyesight uh, or if you uh, had some kind of disease or physical imperfection, they looked upon you uh, negatively. And this is where Jesus really kind of hammered them on that in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Continuing with theological themes, therefore the book demands perfect animals for its many sacrifices and requires priests without deformity. That's what we're talking about. Even the priests physically could not have any deformities. A woman's hemorrhaging after giving birth, sores and burns or baldness. Remember, we talked about the woman with the issue of blood. That was why she was, you know, kind of, kind of hesitant to go in front of the people until she saw our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A man's bodily discharge is covered. Specific activities during a woman's monthly period. And all uh, may be signs of blemish, a lack of perfection, and many, uh, excuse me, and may symbolize human spiritual defects, which break spiritual holiness. This is where, again, they took the law and they built upon what God was doing because God was simply providing a way for them to be clean out in a harsh desert environment. Uh, But they took it uh, as a way for salvation. Continuing on. The person with visible skin disease must be banished from the camp, the place of God's special presence. Just as Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden, such people can return to the camp and therefore to God's presence when they are pronounced whole again by the examining priest. Before they can re-enter the camp, however, they must offer the prescribed perfect sacrifices, these symbolizing the perfect work and the whole sacrifice of Christ Jesus, a person that has a defect or a handicap, or or they may be blind or some type of blemish or disease. They don't have to worry about that anymore in Christ Jesus. But under the law, uh, you were, uh, uh, you know, susceptible to the judgment of men. And that was why uh, they could not exercise the law the way God intended. Now, key doctrines in the book of Leviticus. Again, This is designed not for us to become experts. It is designed for us to be familiar so that when we're having conversations, when questions come up, when someone takes an obscure passage and uses that in a conversation with you, you have enough general awareness to be able to say, okay, let me hear that passage or let's look at that passage, and then you can have a more productive conversation. So if you broke down the entire book of Leviticus, there could be different breakdowns, but when when I look at it, when I've studied it, there's four big primary categories. That's sacrifice, holiness, offerings, and Israel as God's holy nation. And I do have some homework assignments for you guys, so if you want to, 
get your pad and pen together. Uh, when we, before we get out of here, Lord willing, uh, we will be looking at these four categories and there will be uh, some homework assignments. Okay. So let's go back to the first one. Sacrifice. God requires sacrifices from the people to atone for sin. There's two things you guys may want to note. This is not part of your homework, but I'm, I'm, I'm dropping a little breadcrumbs here, giving a little hints. It's the word atonement, and it's the word sin. Don't focus on the word sacrifice so much, but focus on the word atonement and focus on the word sin. To help us, there are some scriptures that we have here. Some of them are related to the New Testament, uh, but part of your assignment is going to be to flush this out, and, I'll, and it'll, it'll become clear once I present the questions to you guys. So this is just know that this is a reference slide. The next one is holiness. You remember when uh, Moses um, approached God at the burning bush, God said, take your what off your feet? Remove them sandals for what is holy. This whole, everywhere you stand, everywhere, any part close to me is holy and hallowed. So the holiness of God is another doctrine that's heavily stressed in the book of Leviticus. And then always keeping in the back of our minds, Romans 15, 4, because again, a lot of the New Testament was based on what Jesus and Paul, what they knew, and Peter, what they knew from the Old Testament. They just put it in context in terms of their salvation. But right living does not change. Whether, whether you are an Old Testament believer or a New Testament believer, the right living, that concept, it does not change. And it is built and based upon uh, some of the things uh, that were in the law when it was rightly uh, rightly understood. Holiness, the single attribute that most summarizes God's perfect character. It is his holiness. Israel was called to be holy as God is holy. In other words, they were to separate themselves from the heathen nations, the, the sinful uh, of uh, things that they were doing, all the things that made them unholy. When you become a Christian, when you are called out of that darkness into the light, you are in essence fulfilling this aspect of the book of Leviticus. There are some passages there, once again, for reference that prescribe or command the holiness. And there's a few uh, passages in there as well that will uh, kind of give you some footnotes when you start doing uh, your, your homework assignments. So that's the second aspect of um, the book of Leviticus. The third one is offerings. Offerings. Again, it's all dealing with worship. Offerings symbolize various forms of worship to God. These provide for the expression of a penitent heart. In other words, Godly sorrow and regret for having done something wrong towards a parental figure, in this case God, repentance. That was the theme behind the offerings, and there's various offerings. And uh, you, again, we're not asking you to be an expert in all of them, but again, for the purpose of our general knowledge, we want to understand them, and then I think it'll make a little bit more sense when we get to the homework assignment. But I just wanted to know that this kind of a flash card slide also is there for your reference. There are some passages there uh, that speak a little bit uh, to offerings, but obviously uh, there would be so much more if you really were going to do an in-depth study um, on offerings. So that is the third uh, key doctrine in the book of Leviticus. The fourth one is Israel as God's holy nation as a holy people, as a holy nation. And they were the ones who were given the promises, who were given 
Uh, it was foretold that the Christ would come and enter the world, but they had a very heavy obligation in living up uh, to this favor that God had shown upon them. And one of the ways we learn, again, repeating Romans 15, 4, is to see how and where and how often they failed, necessitating a Savior. And But in Leviticus, at that time, uh, they were God's chosen nation. And so sometimes, and I've even seen it, where you will have people of a certain persuasion, again, be they Israelite or someone else, they will go back to a text and they will say, aha, God said we are his chosen nation. We are the ones he loved. Okay, we know that. <laughs> but we want to see how does that fit in the overall narrative and not only the fact that God said that they were the holy nation, but how and why they failed to live up to that obligation. It's very, very important. So, don't, so we just don't want to stop at the parts where God is patting you on the back. We want to point out the areas where God was upset and angry and, and, and sent punishment to them uh, because they did not uh, live up to that. That's the whole, uh, the whole context of, um, oh, I'm drop, dropping his name right now, but the gentleman, the one that had to marry the prostitute. What's the, what's the one that had? Hosea, Hosea, Hosea. There you go. That, that whole story in Hosea is emblematic of God being upset because he's married to an unfaithful wife. So even though you can point out passages where God chose them, we know that. But again, all of these failures precipitated a need for a, for a savior. So that would be the fourth key doctrine in the book of Leviticus. We find the, um, in Luke 24, some of you may know this because we have uh, discussed this before, but this was on the road to Emmaus. Uh, this was uh, right after uh, Christ Jesus' uh, death and burial. And then the resurrection. In fact, one of the first scenes after Mary and Martha at the grave site uh, was Jesus appeared to these disciples on the road to Emmaus, but he said something very important. He said to them, because they, they were wondering what was going on, and Jesus, you know, if you go back to verse 43 and 42, he was asking them, you know, what's going on, and why are you guys so sad? <clears throat> and then they said, well, haven't you seen what's happened? You know, and they were talking about the death of their Christ, the Messiah, but they didn't recognize Jesus in his physical form, even though he had been resurrected. And Jesus, on this conversation, he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be what? Fulfilled, Fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Why did Jesus list all three? He listed the law of Moses and he listed the prophets and he listed the Psalms, because all of those things pointed to him, not just the law. But Jesus was expounding to them, and verse 45 kind of, kind of says it, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. And this is really why, brethren, we slow down here at Palomar or other places of, 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 of worship, to really take our time, to try to understand, to try to comprehend the scriptures. It's one thing to read it, just like the Ethiopian eunuch, when Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I let some man guide me? And we have to take time to slow down sometimes and really try to comprehend the scriptures. Verse 46, then he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it is necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. If you continue reading that, they end up in the, in, in the town of Emmaus. Uh, they have a meal there. That is where, you, uh, that where we see uh, Doubting Thomas, who didn't believe, and then Christ Jesus, uh, he leaves them. 
And then that sets up the beginning of the book of Acts. I, me personally, when I preach the book of Acts, I always start here. I always start here because this is his resurrection. And then this will almost be almost like the pregame warm-up before you get into the book of Acts. You come here because that's where he told them uh, to tarry in Jerusalem, and you pick up the book of Acts, Acts chapter number 1. They are there waiting. So that is uh, what Jesus said. And the reason why that is important because based on something that the Apostle Paul told Timothy, and we touched on this a little bit last night, Brother Dash and Brother Jim, but I thought it was really important for us to kind of look at it tonight from a little bit more of an expansive uh, way before we get into the homework assignments. But uh, we know that Timothy, uh, Titus and Timothy, those letters were some of the very uh, last letters that the Apostle Paul wrote. We believe that Apostle Paul wrote about half of the New Testament, uh, 12 to 13, depending on if you think he was a, the author of the book of Hebrews or not. Uh, but if you looked at his writings in chronological order, we know that uh, there's disagreement between the book of Galatians and Thessalonica, which ones were first, but there's no disagreement as to which ones were last, and that is Titus and Timothy. And in writing to this young minister, Timothy, he says, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus while I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they do what? Teach what? Teach no other doctrine. We should be making a mental note and highlighting this. Teach no other doctrine for neither give heed to what? Fables, Fables, which are stories, and endless genealogies. Endless genealogies, trying to figure out who's an Israelite, who's from this tribe, who's from that tribe. I've got DNA for this. I, my grandmother's ancestors, cousins, friends, nephews, brother was from this island. He came on this ship. He was endless genealogies which minister what? Questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. In other words, that's what you're supposed to do. Minister, uh, 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 godly edify one another. Verse 5, now the end of the commandment. Somebody ought to be making a note and go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 5, and look up the Greek word for end and see if it matches Romans 10, 4. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. That would be an excellent uh, concept for you to know. So Paul tells Timothy, now the end of the commandment is charity or love out of what kind of heart? A pure heart and of a what? Good conscience. Y'all remember Paul said, my conscience is clear. And of faith unfeigned, from which which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, vain speech, just babbling and babbling and and, and getting on the internet and arguing and debating and, and just vain jangling. Desiring to be, <laughs> it seems like he wrote this today. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is what? That's why you and I tonight are taking a look at the law because we're trying to say, well, wait a minute, Brother Paul. We, we, we want to understand not just you were, what you said, but where you were coming from. Paul says, but we know that the law is good if a man does what? Use it lawfully. Use it lawfully. Now let's keep reading. 
knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, Brother Jim. It's not made for the righteous, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers and manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers. Y'all should look that word up. That's slavery. When you steal men and you take a man and you take them and you captivate them, it's, it's, not, it's not talking about like a kidnap, Brother Jim. It's talking about putting people in bondage again. For men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing, that is contrary to sound doctrine. That is who the law is for. So now, let's go back into our homework assignments. And we've got time if we, got, if we want to talk a little bit about them. So the first key doctrine that we looked at in Leviticus was sacrifice. For God requires sacrifices from the people to atone for sin. Homework assignment. The sacrificial system required dedication and focus on the specifics. In what way is this applicable for the disciple of Christ? Two parts, second part. In consideration of Romans 15.4, are there principles inherent in these Old Testament commands that would teach us how to walk today? In consideration that Paul knew that all things written before time were for our learning, are there principles inherent in these commands that would teach us how to walk today? Remember the subject is sacrifice. I don't know. I, I, I'm tempted to just go into it right now. <laughs> I'm tempted to go into it right now. Should I? No. Okay. Thank you, Brother Keith. I'm, I'm, I'm itching. Okay. The second one. Holiness. 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 Jim said, keep speaking for itself. <laughs> Holiness, another doctrine that we learned in the book of Leviticus, the single attribute that most summarizes God's perfect character. This was so important to God that he dedicated the entire book of Leviticus to holiness. Israel was called to be holy as God is holy. In fact, if y'all go into Peter, Peter is quoting Leviticus. He's quoting it. He's going to Peter, 1 Peter 4, 17, when he says, uh, um, judgment begins at the house of God. He's quoting, he's not quoting uh, Leviticus here. He's quoting, um, I'm, I'm, I'm dropping my, uh, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 7 through 9. Okay. So homework assignment related to holiness. What contrasts can be made between holiness prescribed in the Mosaic law and that of a disciple of Christ? In other words, there were some very specific things, Brother Jim, that, that marked holiness in the law. What would mark holiness in us today as Christians? Are there any similarities or are there any variables? One big giant variable, variable obviously, is Christ Jesus. But are there any similarities or are there any variables? Okay. The third key doctrine in the book of Leviticus. <clears throat> 
offerings symbolize various forms of worship to God. There were burnt offerings. There were grain offerings. There was a fellowship offering. There was a sin offering. And there was a guilt offering. This one might be kind of tough, guys. It's kind of packed with stuff in here. I, I may help on this one. So just give it a shot. Just, just give it a shot. And if, if you know, wherever you land, we'll, we'll, do a, we'll do a night session on this one. Three questions. What was the purpose of these offerings? What does God need with a burnt offering? What does God need with a grain offering? What does God need with a sin and guilt offering? What's the purpose of these offerings? What's the status for disciples of Christ or Christians relative to the Mosaic system of offerings? What, 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 is it, what is it now on this side of the cross? What does it look like for me and you? What, what, what is it? Then third one. What does true offerings look like for the disciples of Christ? I think question two and three can probably be merged. I would say, guys, uh, everyone, just, you know, take a shot. Don't, don't beat yourself up. This, there's a lot in this one right here and when you start talking about, talk about offerings, okay? And we know that there's tithes, there's offerings. We know that there, there was a commandment for different things. Uh, so once again, that can be a pretty big uh, subject, but we'll, we'll kind of break this one down. Okay, the fourth and final one, to me, I think is probably one of the most important because, you know, the Apostle Paul <clears throat> told people uh, in, in the New Testament, do I need uh, a letter of commendation? He says, you are our letter written and known by all men. In other words, I don't need to go around flashing letters saying, hey, this Paul guy is a good guy. You are now my, our letter written on the heart, uh, hearts and minds of men. So as a holy nation, when God wanted Israel to be holy, our homework assignment is how is a disciple of Christ set apart and what does this do to us as a body. Because remember, in Leviticus, they were set apart as a nation. They were set apart as a nation. So how are we? How does that apply to us today? How are we set apart as a nation? This may or may not come up in one of those conversations, but I, I do think that eventually it would, because even if it's not brought up to you directly, you may want to introduce it. You may want to introduce this as a, uh, as a point of conversation because you want to differentiate uh, Israel of, of the Old Testament Leviticus versus the church, the body of Christ. I, I, I kind of dropped that hint in there, but that's where I was going. How does that, uh, what does that look like? What does it look like to be or mean uh, to be a, a child of God on, in the New Testament? So that was, that was it for tonight. Uh, we've got a few minutes. Are there any questions, thoughts, or comments? I know it's kind of a lot, and uh, you know, we'll see how we want to break it down in the next coming weeks. Um, but this is kind of where I wanted to go. Uh, and the reason why also, too, is because I didn't want us to stay on the law forever. You know, I wanted us to get uh, enough of the law in terms of a general awareness, and it may even spark some of your own personal studies. Uh, but the idea here is uh, kind of an overview or a summary so that we could have intelligent conversations, e even if we can't give everybody book, chapter, and verse for everything. When somebody talks to you about Deuteronomy, if somebody talks to you about Numbers or Exodus, you'll have a general familiarity with uh, those texts and those and those books, but Keith. Yes. This is a scrape in me. Uh, these people or these doctrines or these sects or whatever we want to call them or label, 
they're saying that they're following the law, right? Yes. And we are to uh, enlighten them to why are you carrying on the law? But yet, as in last week, we was, man, there, there, there was, I think, 39 laws. For the Sabbath, 39 melicals. I yes. think there was 39. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet, in Old Testament law, there was sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I'm still mind boggled by that one because for the law considered a sacrifice. I, w I would give you a, um, a hint on that, Keith. Okay. You will, you will want to look in the book of Hebrews. You'll want to look in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews really explains the Old Testament sacrificial system and how that relates to what Christ Jesus did on the cross. That, that, that would be where I would, where I would take you. Anybody else, any thoughts or comments? Again, this is not to make us experts, but one of the big problems that I, I do believe that we have in Christian circles is a general unfamiliarity with the Old Testament. And I'm not saying that that's right or bad, but I think that it's something that we have to start moving towards addressing, where we have a pretty good understanding where to go in the New Testament, why we can make good uh, points. Um, I don't want to use the word arguments, but we can make good points and everything in the New Testament. But we are now having um, groups of people that are... Uh, pretty well read in the Old Testament. And sometimes you get uh, people in Christian circles that uh, just are not as, as read in the Old Testament. So that's why we spent a little bit of time in the law. There's a ton of places that I, I wanted to go. We may still go, but we talked about the 39 Melancholy. We didn't talk about the 613 laws of the Mitzvah. There's, there's so many other places that we can go. Um, and, and leading right up through, to other scriptures in the Old Testament where um, it was very clear that God wanted something else other than the law. We know that obedience is better than sacrifice. But if you guys remember, and it's, it's been said or stated, that one thing that really took Paul for a loop was when he began to study the book of Habakkuk. You guys remember the book of Habakkuk? We looked at that. You remember what Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, four says? The just shall live by faith. That threw Paul for a loop, Jim. He was, he was an expert in the law. And he hadn't really grasped that concept. And then he met Christ Jesus, and Christ, just like we read in Luke 24, opened his understanding. So much so that that phrase was repeated three times in the New Testament. You guys remember what it was? The just shall live by faith. The book of Habakkuk, chapter number two, verse number four. Remember, Habakkuk had a complaint. There was stuff going on in his days, and Brother Dash, and he was he was upset. He wanted to have a talk, a conversation with God, and 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 God finally told him, He says, I'm gonna do something in your time. You're not even gonna believe it. He says, I'm gonna work a work, I'm gonna work a miracle. And then when God told him what he was gonna do, Habakkuk said, Oh no, Lord, not these the Assyrians in them. He says, they're worse than us. Not the God anything, but not them. God told him to tarry, wait for my word, wait for it. Though it might tarry, it's coming, wait for it. 
And he told him, the just, those that are right, those that really love me, those that really, they're going to live by faith. Even though this calamity is coming on you, even though this terrible people is coming on you, even though you guys are going to get tore up from a, from a physical perspective, he said, the just will live by faith. Paul finally got that. He quoted it in Romans chapter number 1. If you go to Romans chapter 1, verse number 16 and 17. He hoped, that's right, Sister, Sister D. He, 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 he quoted again in Galatians. I believe it's 318. 311. There you go, Brother T. And then one more time, if he was the author of Hebrew, is Hebrews chapter 10. You guys remember the verse? 38. Verse 38. Three times. That's how powerful that concept was. So although we're looking at the, the Old Testament, although we're, we're examining the Old Testament, we know and understand where our faith and trust is, and that is in Christ Jesus, the finished work, more importantly, of Christ Jesus. So uh, any other questions or comments? Any thoughts? We still got a couple of minutes. Yes, ma'am. It was uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 4. It is Romans chapter number 1, 16 and 17. It is Galatians chapter 3, verse number 11. And it is Hebrews chapter 10, and the verse is number 38. If you really looked at them thematically, the just shall live by faith. What is the theme of the Roman letter? Justification. Jim, you was on it. Justification. So in the Roman letter, Paul is focusing on the just. What is the theme of the Galatian letter? Freedom in Christ. So in the Galatian letter, he's focusing on the just shall live. He's focusing on your walk. And then what is the, 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 the crux of the Hebrew letter? Faith. The just shall live by faith. He's really focusing on the faith piece. In fact, if you go to, uh, that's uh, Hebrews 10, 38. You go to chapter number 11, it's the hall of faith. It's all about faith in Hebrews chapter number 11. So that's just a little bit. Again, we don't want to spend uh, an ordinate amount of time, but I do think, and even this is not, you know, it doesn't do us any justice because I threw a lot out there tonight. Um, but we want to once again start to familiarize ourselves and um, make a special note, obvious there, of the First Timothy chapter number one, uh, verse one through ten. I thought that you know Paul could have wrote that today, Jim. He could have wrote that today. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay, we have about two minutes left. Do we have any prayer requests? Any prayer requests? I'd like to continue to pray for my coworker, Ed. Um, I haven't talked to him recently. I know that he was in ICU for about 10 days. I think he's out. He's in a, in a regular room right now. I, I don't know if he's been released or not, but I know he was uh, struggling. I'd also like to pray for my son. Uh, he's come down sick, and uh, so I want to pray for him. Uh, my daughter is going to be traveling because of uh, COVID and the shutdown shutdowns, she changed her ticket, so she is leaving before New Year's instead of after New Year's. So we just want to pray for safe travels from her, for her, and um, I believe that Shani is still in the hospital. Yeah, Shani went back to the hospital, and so we just really, really want to pray for her. And I haven't seen uh, Carmen in a couple of weeks. So we want to pray for Carmen as well, Carmen and his wife. Anybody else? Brother Jim? Oh, yeah. No, we haven't figured that out yet. What Jim was asking about is are, are we going to do the uh, New, Year's, um, um, New Year's Eve uh, thing? We might end up canceling. But I think we'll, we'll, we'll talk collectively, and then we'll make a decision like tomorrow so that everybody has plenty of notice. Um, anybody else have any prayer requests? Amen. Sister D, continue prayer for your family. Amen. Anybody else? Brother Tony? Uh, uh, prayer for Kayla. Uh, she's oh. currently with Alicia in Texas, but she'll be traveling back home.
home. Mm -hmm. Also, she's uh, in the midst of trying to buy her a home. Okay, so amen. Pray that, uh, that's good. good. Amen. That's that's a good those are good times. It can be a little stressful until it's done, uh, but that was a, that's a good thing. Um, okay, anybody else? No one else has any prayer requests. Um, I do not. I would probably check with Tony or Jim for an address for Brother Gerald to give him a card. Okay. Yeah, we definitely want to pray for Gerald. Um, I believe he's still at home right now, but he's still recovering. Um, so um, who did the opening prayer? Jim Bradash, you want to close this? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne of grace, mercy, peace, and love, Father, again, we're just so thankful for this opportunity that you've given us, Father. Allowing us, Father, to wake up, Father, to see another day on this time side of life, Father. Keeping us safe and sound from the last time that we met, Father, to worship you, Father. We're just so thankful for that, Father. We're just thankful, Father, for Jesus, the sacrifice that he did for us, Father, the pain and suffering that he went through, Father, when he did no wrong, Lord. And he did that on our behalf, Father. And we're just so thankful, Father. We just love you, Father, because you first loved us. And that's demonstrated, Father, each and every second of our lives, Father. And we're just so appreciative for that, Father. We have so many prayer requests, Father. We just ask, Lord, that you hear them all, Lord. If it be your will, Lord. We just ask, Father, that you bless the sick and afflicted at this time. There's just so much sick in this world, Father, spiritually and physically, Lord. We just ask, Father, that you bless them all, Father. Heal them, Father. Keep them safe and sound, Father. Encourage those that are around them, that are taking care of them, Father. We ask, Father, that you continue to encourage them, Father. Allow them, Father, to fully trust in you and know that you are the ultimate healer, Father. We ask prayers for those who are traveling at this time, Lord. We ask, Father, that you keep them safe and sound and let them make it to their destinations, Father, to and fro, Father. We also ask special prayers, Father, for those who, who may just be traveling at this time, Father. I ask, Father, that you just continue to keep them safe and sound as well, Father. Father, we just ask, Lord, that you continue to forgive us for any sins that we may have committed, whether it be word, thought, or deed, Father, that you continue to keep us safe and sound, Father, as we travel to our homes. We just ask, Father, to be your will, Lord, that we're able to meet at the next appointed time, Father. Guide us, strengthen us, and care for us, Father. In Jesus' name we do pray and give thanks. Amen.